How is everyone today? Fantastic. Well, it is so good to see each one of you today, and uh, I'm excited to be here. How about you? What a beautiful day to be here praising the Lord together. And also, it's kind of interesting because I can actually see all of you, which is just fantastic. You know, during the meeting, we use the, the light to, to, for the spotlight, just kind of a thing, you know, and, and uh, it's great because I, I well, not really great. I, I can't see anything but the light. And so, so uh, I, I told someone after the meeting, I said, everybody could sneak out of here and I'd have absolutely no idea. <laughs> no, it was all over. <laughs> so, well, I have, uh, well, oh, I, I just wanted to mention too, I'm sorry, I always, I always forget, not that we don't love you people who are watching the live stream, but we want to welcome you as well. And, uh, and uh, we can't see you, but uh, you can see us, and, and we're very grateful that you are here, and, and all of our visitors, and, and uh, we just want you to know that uh, we're so glad you are here to worship. Um, I have a little bit of a weird announcement that I just want to mention, and some of you will be familiar with this. I was a, a little bit taken by surprise by it, but, um, but I got the, an email from the conference that it is time for us to choose delegates for our 2021 uh, 31st regular constituency meeting. You guys know, any of you know anything about this? Am I the only one that's like, what in the world? Okay. So anyway, so we need to, to choose uh, four regular people. So if you're a regular people, if you would get in contact with me. Um, we need two alternate delegates, so if you feel like an alternate person. And then we need organizing committee delegates. So if you're into, into organizing, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. So we need to, to get this done probably sometime this week. And so um, I, what I would really love would be for you to either call or text me and volunteer. And if we don't have somebody by the end of the week, I'll be calling and begging. So some of you be prepared for that and don't answer when I call. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's something that we need to take care of. And, and so if you would be interested, the, the meeting, by the way, I should give you all the details now, shouldn't I? Um, the meeting is going to be October 24, 2021. And uh, just in case they can't hold it in person, I think they'd like to hold it in person. I think it's probably in Phoenix or Scottsdale. But, um, but they said to... to have people that wouldn't mind being on Zoom if it were to come to that. And so if you're if you feel like zooming, then that would be a good thing too. But anyway, we need to kind of be thinking about that this week. And so if you would be interested in, in being a part of that, then just contact me and and uh, if you don't call me, I'll call you. So um, another thing that I just want to mention is, is uh, we're having our, our regular prayer service Monday evening at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. Uh, we, we definitely want to be in prayer, don't we? All the time, but especially right now. We want to be in, in, uh, in prayer as a family here. Uh, and uh, Wednesday night, we're not having our normal uh, Bible study time because we're instead having our, our evangelistic meetings Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, and I know a lot of us have been there uh, for, for some of these meetings, and, and uh, I hope that they are a blessing, but it, it's been a lot of fun, hasn't it? It's been actually really, really very cool. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of just keep that before us, and I can't think of any other announcements right now. I hope I'm not forgetting anything, but let's, uh, oh, oh, wait, I just thought of another one. So um, something else that we want to do is there is someone who is very near and dear to our hearts here and uh, they've they've been here a, a long time and and they do so much for us but much more importantly uh we we love them and i'm thinking of course of mike and dorothy van geistel and uh and we know that uh that fairly soon that that they're going to be heading out and uh and not necessarily being able to come back around as much as you have previously, although we hope that we will see you sometimes. You know, this is a good destination to, to, uh, to visit. But, but something I just want to just kind of keep before us is that, that next Sabbath, um, after church in the evening, probably around 6.30 p.m., we are looking to have a get-together. 
where we could have someone come. Have we told you about this, by the way? Just curious. Okay. Are you doing anything next Saturday night? <laughs> yeah, you know what? That, that ended up kind of not working. So I apologize. That's my fault that it didn't get changed. And, oh, thank you for mentioning that, though, Pastor, that, that, um, that we, we had hoped to do something this evening, but, uh, but, but then some of the organization wasn't, wasn't going to be able to happen basically. And so um, I, I forgot that we had gotten that put in the bulletin for this week. That's my fault, not anybody else's. But anyway, so we're going to aim for next Sabbath then, and, uh, and we'll do that next Sabbath at 6.30 p.m. Everybody able to come? What do you think? Oh, there's a lot of hands, so that's good. But we definitely want to get together, and, and we just want to let you know in, in a thousand different ways how much we love you and appreciate you. And and uh, and how tempted we are to, to uh, flatten the tires on your moving van and all those things. So anyway, we, we, really, we really hate to see you go. But let's bow our heads together and, and seek the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much that we can gather here together as a family. We're here because we love you and we love each other. We enjoy fellowshipping together. We enjoy worshiping together. And we know that this is what heaven is going to be like when we can be together for all of eternity. And we will be able to enjoy being at your, around your throne. What incredible joy we have to look forward to. And so this morning we are asking you to send your Holy Spirit and to just fill us with that gratefulness and joy that we have this eternal future to look forward to. We are your children. We are your sons and daughters. And we are your friends, Lord, and, and we love you ever so much. So I just pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to be with us in a special way. Just fill our hearts, fill our minds, stay close to us. And I pray that, uh, that this service will be an incredible blessing to each one because of the incredible God that we serve. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Hebrew 11, we'll read our scripture for today. 11 verses 1 through 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which were visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was translated so that he did not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Again, it is that time for the offering and the tithe to be received into the hands of the one that is special to us because he gave us so many different ways to think about why we're here today and why it is that we've chosen to, to give from a sense of sorts in our daily lives. Something that really stood up to me and stood out to me this week and really through this whole quarter and now with this, uh, this series, is as a church, we're reminded that there is a servant of cycles in life. 
And we, we found that this week in, in, in the approach of life as the servant of cycles express themselves, that there's a song that each one of us can have each and every day with God. And it is to learn more of the sensitivity and the submissive element that exists within our Father of lights and is expressed through our Lord and Savior Jesus. And so today's offering really comes from the sense that, you know, as I've been growing up and I've been having the opportunity to be a partaker of church service and, and all the beautiful amenities that go with it, and, and, I, and I, you know, I reach out to those who are listening today, too, that to be reminded that this is a time, again, of a cycle of sensitivity and submission. And as I've listened to the pastor and, and his evening uh, lessons to us in our hearts, there's a song in this man's heart, and it wants to be expressed mightily because that's what God does in his children. And so... Again, be partakers today uh, of knowing that God's really working in a very special way. And, uh, and for those that are listening and watching too, just be mindful of that because every church needs a people that are very sensitive to the needs of others and are submissive in the fact that we grow in grace and know that by faith, of the things that are not seen as we're going to hear today, and I'm sure they're going to be fascinating because I really appreciate what you shared last week too because I think it just seems to go on the same heels of knowing this. And I know I won't belabor you with a lot of more words, but I would ask the deacons to please rise and remember uh, the series and the hearts that are at work and that God is really working amazingly in these hours that we live. Shall we bow our heads? Father, it is with great earnestness that we come to you. Our hearts are uh, yearning to know more of you. That's why we're here today. And uh, for those watching and listening online, we, our hearts go out to you today. And uh, the prayers that we think and reason with each day, it's important that we never forget what you've uh, come to bless us with. Even though it seems like at times those curses just seem to agitate. But Lord, you knew the cycles. You know the, the evidence uh, that each one of us must come to realize about you. And with the tithe and offerings today, I, I feel is a very important one. Because it is one that teaches us humility. One that teaches us how to serve. And to come to serve. Thank you for honoring us with the means. And we ask your blessings to rest upon them as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, it's time for prayer. Neil, if you're able to. Mm. Mm. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for bringing us here another Sabbath day to spend time with you, to worship you, and to give you thanks for all of your blessings you have done for us. 
Thank you for protecting us throughout the week, dear God. Thank you for bringing us here safely, giving us the minds to come and worship you. Dear Father, thank you for providing for us, dear Jesus, during this difficult time. Many people are without jobs, but thank you for giving us all our needs, dear Lord, and even some of our wants as well. I pray that you will bless each and every one of us, dear Lord, and all those for the series that have been put together, that participated, that organized it. I pray that, that you will help to win souls, dear Lord, for the time is short. I just thank the pastor and his family. Lord, you protect them as they travel, especially on the Sabbath days from Parker to here and to Bullhead. That you guide them and protect them, dear Lord, and bring them back safely. I also have a special request for Ray Cummings, who is not well, dear Father. There's nothing too hard for you, dear Jesus, that you can't make right for us, dear Lord, if we come to you in faith, believing that you are able and willing to do anything, dear Father, that we ask. That I pray that you send healing and comfort to him, dear Father, and to his family as well. Guide and protect us and be with us throughout this week. And I pray that we will draw closer to you, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and forgive us of our sins as we ask these mercies in your precious name. Amen. While our first special music is taking its place, uh, I wanted to make a, uh, a couple of comments. I first knew of Marvin back in the, in the 80s up in the state of Washington, and uh, uh, he sang in a, first I knew about it, he sang bass in a, 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 another type of a organization like the Heritage Singers. Their uh, leader had been a member of that organization and Marvin, I'd see him sing with different groups, always singing the bass. And uh, I later became a, a teacher for his children, and then a couple years later taught his niece and nephew. So I've been around Marvin in many other aspects as well. But he comes here quite often, visits the cools, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that you understood who he was and what he has accomplished in his life, and we're very... Thankful that he's here this morning. I want to thank Jesus for the plan of salvation just to say Lord I love you for you understand I want to be there on that great judgment morning to touch all the nail prints in his feet and his hand one morning at day break a crowd slowly gathered they were walking my lord uh, oh calories so sad was the scene there the birds hush they're singing 
Like a lamb he was humble To his father's own will I want to thank Jesus For the plan of salvation Just to say, Lord That great judgment morning to touch all the new friends in his feet and his hands. I want to. For that and it is time now for our children's story so if all of our young people would like to come up to the front then Yvonne has a story for you this all of you? I'm so happy to see you. Okay, you guys come up one by one and tell me your name with a smile. Wyatt. Good morning, Wyatt. Elizabeth. Good morning, Elizabeth. Grace. Good morning, Grace. David. Good morning, David. Jalissa. Good morning, Jalissa. Hannah. Good morning, Hannah. Haley. Good morning, Haley. Casey. Good morning, Casey. Andrew. Good morning, Andrew. Now I'm going to count up to three, and when I hit three, I want you all to say, Good morning, Miss Yvonne. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay, so would anybody um, like to come up and volunteer to say a little prayer? Oh, Hannah. Here, hold the mic. Okay. And I'll talk. Go. Dear Jesus, please help us have a good day today. Amen. Thank you, Hannah. Very nice. <laughs> Next week. <laughs> you want to say a prayer? You want to say a prayer now? Okay. Dear Jesus, thank you for bringing all these children here for the story. In the name we pray, amen. Amen. Casey, you said you wanted to say something? Hold, hold the mic. 
Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Help us to have a good church today. And thank you for Yvonne and everything she does. Help us and help the kids to understand the story. Amen. Amen. Very nice, Casey. Thank you. Today's story is entitled, Could It Be True? After Jesus died, his disciples stayed together in a place, in one place, and they kept the door locked. They were afraid of the leaders and the rulers who had arrested Jesus and killed him on the cross. They didn't want anything else bad to happen. And they were and then they heard good news from the woman who had gone to Jesus' tomb. The woman said, Jesus was alive. His body was not in the tomb. An angel had told him that Jesus had risen. And Mary had even said that she had seen him. Could it all be really true? Oh, how the disciples wanted it to be true, but they weren't sure. And then that evening, while they were together in an upper room, the door locked. Suddenly, with the door locked, suddenly... Jesus was standing right there, too. Could it really be him, or was it a ghost? The disciples didn't know what to think or what to do. They were afraid. There's Jesus in the white. See him? You that? Do you think that would be scary? Do you, to suddenly see Jesus there? Be at peace, Jesus told them. There's no need to be troubled. You don't need to doubt. It's really me. See my hands and my feet? He showed them the disciples, the places in his hands and his feet where the nails had been. You can touch me, he said. I have a body. Oh, this was wonderful. Jesus was alive. Do you have anything to eat? Jesus asked. Aw, Jesus was hungry. They gave him some fish, and he ate it while they watched. Yes, this really was Jesus. How amazing and wonderful. The glad news they had heard was true. But one of the disciples, Thomas, wasn't with the others when Jesus came to see them. Thomas, Thomas, it's true, it's true, the disciples told Thomas when he came back. Jesus is alive, they said. We have seen him. We saw the places in his hands and his feet where the nails were. Thomas shook his head. I don't believe it, he said. I won't believe it unless I can put my hands on the places where the nails were. The next time the disciples... Let you see Thomas right there. See Thomas? He was doubting for sure, wasn't he? I think that was his nickname. Doubting Thomas. See that? Can you see it? (laughs) Oh, I'll get that later. The next time the disciples were all together, eight days later, Thomas was there, and suddenly Jesus was there too. Thomas, put your hands here where the nails were, Jesus said. See that it is really me and believe Thomas saw and touched Jesus' hands where the nails had been. My Lord and my God, now you have believed because you have seen me, Jesus said. That is good, but blessed are those who haven't seen me and still believe. Mm -hmm. 
Wyatt. Thank you, Casey. In some places, children learn to say, yes, sir, and no, sir, yes, madam, and no, madam, as a way of speaking politely to grown-ups. In Bible times, people often call men, my Lord, to show them respect and be polite. But when Thomas called Jesus Lord, he was not just being polite, Thomas called Jesus Lord because he understood that Jesus is God's son, the ruler over all. Have you ever wished you could actually see Jesus, touch him, and hear his words? Are there times you want to sit down with him and get his advice. Thomas wanted Jesus' physical presence, but God's plan is wiser. He has not limited himself to one physical body. He wants to be present with you all at all times. Even now, he is with you in the form of the Holy Spirit. You can talk to him, and you can find him his words to you in the pages of the Bible. He can be as real to you as he was to Thomas. Jesus wasn't, ha wasn't hard on Thomas for his doubts. Despite his skepticism, Thomas was still loyal to the believers and to Jesus himself. Some people need to doubt before they believe. If doubt leads to questions and questions lead to answers, and if answers are accepted, then doubt has done good work. It is when doubt becomes stubbornness and stubbornness leads to a prideful lifestyle that doubt harms faith. When you doubt, don't stop there. Let your doubt Deepen your faith as you continue to search for the answers. Jesus' resurrected body was unique. It was not the same kind of flesh and blood Lazarus had when he came back to life. Jesus' body was no longer subject to the same laws of nature as before his death. He could appear in a locked room Yet he was not a ghost because he could be touched and he could eat. Jesus' resurrection was literally and physically. He was not disembodied spirit. Some people think they would believe if G in Jesus if they could see a definite sign of a miracle. But Jesus said we are blessed if we can believe without seeing. We have all the proof we need in the words of the Bible and the testimony of believers. A physical appearance would not make Jesus any more real to us than he is now. The good news includes everything we need to know to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, through whom we receive eternal life. The end. Now I got something special for you guys, and it's really heavy, so you gotta be careful when you get it. So come up one by one and take it. Which color do you want? Got it, good. Okay, go. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, you guys. Okay. I love you. I'll be praying for you this week. Love you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Did everybody? Hey, girls, did you get one? Come on. Come on. Everybody gets one.
And wasn't that beautiful? <coughs> I loved both of those special musics. And they both had such a tremendous message for us. And uh, we appreciate that very, very much. Well, as uh, I believe it was Brother Russell uh, mentioned earlier, yes, this sermon is a companion to last week's. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Got things in my lungs, which is <coughs> why I brought some water. Yes, what was our topic last week? It was prayer, exactly. And now, this week, we are looking at Hebrews chapter 11. And does somebody know what the topic of Hebrews 11 is all about? Faith. It's about faith. And those two have to go together. And we're going to be seeing that a little more this morning. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 has been called God's Hall of Fame. It's one of the great chapters in the Bible, but it's important, I don't think so much for the people who are in there. You know, we think of a hall of fame as being something to glorify people. The Bible was never written to glorify people, but it's talking about these people more, not because of who is in the hall of fame, as it is the reason that they are listed. So the topic is Faith. It's often called the faith chapter. But I'd like to point out this morning some of the things that would have been much more apparent to the people who first read Paul's letter of the, to the Hebrews than it is to us. Because they could read it in the original and they could get messages from it that we have a hard time getting. Let's look again at Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So he starts right out in this chapter with a definition, a very short, very succinct definition of faith. It's very simple. Many of us have probably memorized that verse. But I think it says a lot more than most of us are aware of. So I want to look at it in some detail, looking especially at one particular word in that verse, the word that in the King James and New King James versions of the Bible, probably a few others as well, is the word substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is said that when scholars were commissioned by King James I of England, to translate the Bible into English, into what we call the King James Version of the Bible, they came to this word in the Greek and they didn't know what to do with it. It's one of those words that wasn't used very often in the Bible. It's only found in three other places. And they were such different contexts that they didn't shed much light on how this word should be translated. And so, they simply took the word, they divided it into its two major parts and translated each part and put it back together. Now, we are acquainted a little bit with some of the Greek that is here because <clears throat> the word in the Greek is hypostasis. Now, some of that has been brought directly into the English in ways that you will recognize because the first part is hupa or hypo, and it refers to something under, either like a hypodermic needle, which goes under the dermis, under the skin, so they call it hypodermic, or something there's too little of, like hypoglycemia, if you have too little blood sugar. And so the hypo is something under. Then the other part of it, the stasis, often pronounced stasis, usually refers to stopping or standing, such as stopping the flow of blood or other body fluids rather than, uh, that it's standing rather than flowing. And so the entire word has been brought into the scientific world 
in the word hypostasis, or uh, you know, hypostasis, where it's used to mean a foundation or a material that settles to the bottom of a liquid, and so it is under. It is something standing under. So the King James translators put the two parts of this word together, using the prefix sub for under, and stance for standing, and came up with quite a different word, substance or substance. And so now we have in our King James Version, or New King James, the word faith is substance. It is the substance. Now since 1611, we've had over 400 years to learn more about that word, and quite a bit has been learned about it. In fact, it's been found that when they look at other sources besides the Bible, that it could be a very versatile word that was used in quite a variety of different ways. And one of the interesting, and it turned out, commonly used meanings of the word in the days of Paul is demonstrated by the true story of a wealthy woman of the Roman Empire by the name of Dionysia. Dionysia, and this is a true story, Dionysia ran into legal problems. It appears that there was a dispute over the ownership of some land that she felt like she possessed, and so she took the matter to court. Well, unfortunately, she lost her case. But in one of the documents, she is said to be a woman of set jaw and grim determination. Now, you may remember we talked about a widow lady last week that uh, was very persistent. She was always going after the judge trying to get justice. Well, this lady seems to be a little different, except that this lady is wealthy. And true to her characteristics, she wasn't satisfied with the outcome of the court trial. And so she decided to appeal to a higher court in Alexandria. Remember, Alexandria was in Egypt, but it was part of the Roman Empire, and it was a very important city, a city of scholars and so forth, and it had a higher court. So she gathered up her important papers, she gave them to her slave, and sent him to Alexandria to present her case. But some problems were encountered. No doubt he was her most trusted slave and was very dependable, but he made one mistake. He chose the wrong place to stay one night when he stopped for the evening. He, it, was a, it was an inn, so it was, should have been a good place to spend the night, but the fire they were using for warmth got out of control and burned the place down during the night. Well, the papers had been placed in a stone box, and so they were perfectly safe from the flames. But, sadly, the poor slave did not fare as well. And so the papers were carried no farther. That was the end of that journey. Furthermore, apparently no one ever went through the wreckage or tried to rebuild the inn or have anything more to do with it, and so it remained there, undisturbed as the sands of time, little by little, covered it up until nobody even knew it was there. And they covered it up with the stone box and the charred body of the poor slave still there. Well, no doubt Dionysia waited impatiently for some word on her case from Alexandria and probably wondered for the rest of her life why her case was never heard and her slave never returned. But 2,000 years later, archaeologists discovered that inn. They dug it up, and they found this stone box still filled with papers. They took the papers out, and they found where Dionysia had written a cover letter for the contents of that stone box. And in this letter, Dionysia said, in order that my lord the judge may know that my appeal is just, I attach my hypostasis. Now the attached document was translated and was found to be the deed, the title deed, to the piece of land which she claimed as her own possession, the evidence of her ownership. 
And so we find that when used in its technical sense, which may have been what Paul was thinking of, hypostasis refers to a deed or a title deed, proof of the possession of something else. And the writer of Hebrews may have had this very idea in mind when he wrote so beautifully about the experience of true faith. When we are in a faith relationship with God, we hold title to everything that he has promised us. We may not be able to hold the item in our hands. We may not be able to see it with our physical eyes, but we own it nonetheless. When we see this meaning, I think we can see why Paul put special emphasis on certain stories that he told in his Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. For example, he spent more time talking about Abraham and Sarah than anyone else in the entire chapter, probably because they best as illustrated what he was trying to convey, what he was trying to say. Abraham, you remember, was living very comfortably, probably on a large estate in the beautiful and very civilized city of Ur of the Chaldees. It was positioned in Mesopotamia, that many of you have in your uh, history classes learned was the cradle of civilization. Uh, mathematics and other things were at an advanced stage for that period there in that region. And uh, this city was probably a very, very beautiful city, and Abraham was probably one of the wealthiest residents of that city. Probably had a large estate, may have had other outbuildings for his servants and so forth. Very comfortable. He had it made. And what did God ask him to do? He asked him to leave. And so Abraham picked up and left, probably to the shock and surprise of his neighbors. You know, Abraham, you've got it so good. Why are you leaving? And where are you going? I don't know. God just said to go, so I'm going. And so he moved by the usual route almost a thousand miles from where he lived to a land that was totally in the possession of other people. And Paul admits in verse 13 that Abraham never lived to be recognized as the owner of that land. But he knew he was the, loan, the owner because he had the title deed to that land. God had given it to him, and that was enough for him. And so Hebrews 11 is full of stories about great men and women of God with similar experiences where they accepted the deeds to promises before actually seeing the fulfillment of those promises. And I believe Paul had a lesson in that for us. Scripture is filled with promises. I don't know if you've ever gone through and tried to list the promises, but there are thousands of them, and they are there for us but they are worthless without one added ingredient. They are there for us, but they are totally out of our reach without the hand of faith holding the key. And what is the key? What we talked about last week, prayer. We need the key of prayer in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse. And it's because faith is so vital that not only does God have a lot to say about faith, but some of his strongest statements in Scripture are on the subject of faith. There are at least 743 places in the Bible where God refers to faith, believing, and trusting. God goes so far as to say in Hebrews 11, verse 6, that without faith it is impossible to please him. Does that make it pretty important? Yeah. And without, uh, and one more text that I have to read because it surprised me so much the first time I noticed it is Revelation 21, verse 8. And we see there the list of terrible sins that will cause people to end up in the lake of fire. I want you to notice how that list begins. Here's the list of these terrible sins. He says, but, Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, if we're ever tempted to be deceitful, 
he includes all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, obviously, any of this can be repented of. It can be forgiven. We can, uh, you know, come to the Lord after we have done some of those things. But it's interesting to me that the fearful and the unbelieving, those without faith, are lumped together with murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, and idolaters. Does it sound like God is pretty concerned about whether we have faith or not? Very concerned. So this morning I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the elements that I think make faith so vital. It's a broad topic, we could spend weeks on it, but I'm just going to notice four things that I believe faith does for us. First, might seem the most mundane, but I think it's one of the greatest needs in the world today. And that is, uh, as we find in the words of the psalmist, Psalm 125 verse 1 assures us, those that trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. And Jeremiah, you remember one of God's prophets, he was not very well received in his day. He uh, there were a number of attempts to kill him. He saw a lot of trouble, ended up, you remember, being thrown into a pit that was muddy at the bottom, and he sank in just about up to his waist, and he would have died there if a few friends hadn't finally come and taken a whole bunch of guys to pull him out. But anyway, he had a lot of trouble. And he said in Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. What is he seeing here? Both of these people, these writers of the Bible, what did they find to be a great blessing that they receive from their experience of faith and trust. I would say, one way to say it would be stability in life. To be able to remain firm, unmoved, unruffled by the problems, the uncertainties, the vicissitudes of life. A simple thing, but how desperately needed in a world where we never know what's going to happen next. You know, the coronavirus problem just hit us all of a sudden. And all of a sudden, our world changed completely in a very short time. And we never know what's going to happen next. But according to these men, it doesn't matter what happens. We can still be stable. We can still be happy. We don't have to worry. Uh, the Apostle Paul was able to say in Philippians 4.11, I have learned in whatever state I am, even Arizona, no, but whatever situation I am, to be content. So what kind of situations did he find himself in? You remember reading 2 Corinthians where he lists some of these things in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 27? He says, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep, apparently in the ocean with no boat. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren, people who claim to be Christians but weren't. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Would you like a life like that? <laughs> it doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And yet, he said, no matter what happened, he was content. Why? Because, you remember, he said later, he had kept the faith. He had held in his heart, heart the title deed to a crown of righteousness. You remember which he said, the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, the day of his coming. So Paul says, I don't have to worry. It's no problem for me. I'm not going to say more about this right now, but oh, for that stability of life that can come only as we receive the title deed to heaven's riches. 
There's a second thing that faith does, I think, for the one holding heaven's title deed. It frees us to act. What do I mean by that? Let me illustrate with a biblical example. Israel, you remember, was camped on the borders of the promised land. This was the second time that it had found itself in that position. And 40 years before, it had sent spies into the land, you remember, to see if the land really was as good as God had said it was and to see how difficult it would be in human terms to take possession of. We know the story of the report of the spies bearing the good news that the land was more fabulous than they had even imagined, but the bad news that they couldn't possibly take it. They could never take possession of it. Well, we know that the result was tragedy. The people first became despondent about the bad news, and then they became angry, angry with God, angry with Moses, for leading them to a land, spending 40 years in the wilderness, and they couldn't take it. And then they became so angry that they decided they were going to kill Moses and Joshua and Caleb because they wanted them to go ahead and go on in. What had happened? They had lost the title deed to this land. They had held it in their possession for 400 years, more than 400 years. You remember, God had given it to Abraham when he left Ur, and he had passed it on to his son Isaac, and then passed on to Jacob, and then to the sons of Jacob, who became the heads of 12 tribes, and they had held that through their slavery in Egypt. All this time, for 400, over 400 years, they held on to that title deed. And finally, when they got to the land that God had promised them, they lost it. They couldn't go in. They had lost their faith. The Apostle James tells us that faith without works is dead. I would suggest that worthwhile works without faith are impossible. We can't do it. They didn't have faith, they didn't have their title deed anymore, and they were paralyzed. And because they had so willingly given up their title deed to the land, and as I said, even threatened to kill Moses and Caleb and Joshua for hanging on to it, God never returned the title deed to them. But he held it in trust for their children. And so 40 years later, we find their children in the same position, though not in the same spot of land as their parents, but they're again on the borders of the promised land. Again, it's time to go in and possess the land. And so God returns the title deed to them. But this time, he doesn't make it as easy for them as he did the first time. Remember the first time they're on the borders of the land, God said, go forth, and they could have done it. They could have walked right in. This time, they're on the wrong side of the Jordan River. And the Jordan River wasn't always too difficult to cross, but at this point, it was terribly difficult. It was during the flooding, the times of flooding. It was a raging torrent. It was impassable. There was no way to get across it, and God waits to see what they will do. But things are different this time. They have learned their lesson. And with their title deed to the land firmly in hand, their faith strong, they march right into that raging river at God's command. This was a much greater test even than the test at the Red Sea. Because you remember at the Red Sea, God parted the waters and he caused a wind to dry out the land so that they could walk on dry land through the Red Sea. And he said, go. This time, they had to walk into the raging river before it even parted. They had to start out wading across a river that was too deep for them before God opened the way. But this time, with their faith strong, their title deed clutched tightly in their hands, they have the freedom to act. No longer are they paralyzed as their parents were. They move forward, the way opens before them and they enter the promised land. That is what faith does. And I think we find examples of this maybe even in everyday life. I think of our astronauts who are frequently shuttling back and forth into space, and uh, I believe that they are able to do that and to even try new things. You know, they go on spacewalks outside the spaceship and so forth. 
because I think they have implicit faith in a competent, caring ground crew in Houston, that they feel like they're going to take care of them. They've got it all worked out. And faith frees us to act. It can free us to do great things for God. But there's a third thing that faith does for us. And that is faith opens the way for relationship. The entire great controversy that we are in the middle of right now, being waged between God and Satan, has been allowed to go on because of this principle. God has allowed the evil one time and space in which to demonstrate the principles of his government. Because it's important for not only us in this world, but for the universe to know what Satan's way of life, what his government would really be like. Because someday, when the day comes that Satan and his forces are to be finally eradicated from the universe, God will be able to perform what the Bible calls his strange act. You know, God is in the, is in the business of saving people, not destroying people. But at some point, he's going to destroy all sin, which has to include those who want to hang on to sin. And he's going to perform his strange act of destruction. And he wants to make sure that when he has to do that, he can do it without destroying the faith and the trust of his faithful creatures that they have in him. And so God has bent over backwards, so to speak. He has gone the second, the third, and the fourth mile. He has accepted personal pain for himself. He has done everything he can to protect the faith of his beloved creatures, to be certain that their faith is not replaced by fear or misunderstanding when the fire falls on the wicked. And why is that so important to him? Because a meaningful relationship can only develop in the trusting environment of faith. And above everything else in the universe, God desires a relationship of love and trust with his precious creatures. Is it any wonder that, faith, that without faith it is impossible to please God? Apparently, without faith, it is impossible to fully love God. And love is what pleases him the most. But there's one final thing that faith does for us that I want to mention, among many that we could talk about, and that is this. Faith allows God to do for us that which he wants to do anyway. Do you notice that many times in Scripture, God says such things as we find in Mark 9.23, all things are possible to whom? To him who believes. Or Matthew 21, 22. Everything you ask in prayer, doing what? Believing you shall receive. God has, as I mentioned before, storehouses of blessings filled to overflowing with gifts that he is impatient to shower upon his people. He loves us. And as a most loving and caring heavenly parent. He would like to give us everything our hearts could possibly desire. But we are told in that familiar quote, prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse. And why must we have this key? Why such a need for faith? I think the question deserves more study than we have time for this morning, but I would suggest two answers. One is, even the greatest of God's gifts might not be a blessing in the hands of the wrong person. Have you ever noticed the way God's greatest gifts to mankind seem to have the greatest potential for causing suffering and misery when they are abused or twisted from God's original intent. For example, from the time humans were created there in the Garden of Eden, God has wanted fellowship with them. You remember it describes how Jesus would come down in the cool of the evening to visit with Adam and Eve. He didn't create this world to be just a, you know, a, a interesting thing to watch, you know, a zoo or a, an aquarium or whatever. He created this world to be a beautiful place for us to enjoy, and he created us to be beings that would love him and he could love in return because God is love. 
And love has to have an object. And God wanted us to be his friends. And so he created us with uh, an innate desire, even a need, to worship. Because he wanted us to want him. And the universal practice of religion, you go anywhere in the world and people worship something. There are a few people that claim to be atheists, but often even that kind of falls apart in certain circumstances. People are driven to worship. And it's evidence that one of God's gifts to us from creation is the need we have to worship, the keen desire we have to find relationship with him. And a right relationship with God, as nearly everyone in this room can attest, can be the most satisfying and enjoyable experience of life. But in the hands of Satan, this same built-in need to worship has been twisted to where religion, falsely practiced, has stained the history of our world with the blood of untold millions of innocent people. From the time of Cain and Abel, through the time of the terrors perpetrated by the church of the Middle Ages, and down to modern times, even today, in the 21st century, millions of people have been killed and tortured to, in the waging of holy wars, they call them, campaigns against heretics, and what some religions call infidels, various forms of religious intolerance. False religion has caused tremendous suffering. Likewise, another of God's greatest gifts, also originating in Eden, is marriage and the family and the love that should cement family relationships. But how many can testify to the fact that this wonderful gift that can bring such happiness can also bring the deepest pain if something goes wrong. And I could go on. Again, it appears that the greater the potential of a gift of God for good, the greater is its potential for harm in the hands of Satan. And so God does not shower his gifts upon men and women indiscriminately. He reserves many of his gifts for those who are in such a relationship with him that it will prove a blessing and not a curse to the recipients. And a second reason, I think, that the key of prayer in the hand of faith is essential is the limits that God has voluntarily placed upon himself so that the principles of Satan's kingdom can be seen for what they are with their terrible results. And that is kind of mentioned already, that that's one reason why there is still pain and suffering in this world. God, we can say, well, God has the power to stop all of it. He could, but he can't and let the universe see what Satan's way is like. And so he has to allow a lot of it to take its natural course. In order to ultimately eradicate sin from the universe while retaining the love and trust of his creatures, in a certain sense, God must play fair in a way that the whole universe will say, yes, God, you did everything you could to save these people. Your love is evident, and we can understand why you have to destroy sin and sinners. So there are ways in which he would like to intervene on our behalf, but he cannot unless he can point to us before the universe and say, these are my children. They are begging me to intervene in their behalf. They are trusting me to do it. I have to to do it. And the universe will say, yes, you really do. The story of Job gives us some insight into this interaction that God has with other beings and uh, even with Satan. So it's vital for God's people to reach out to him with the hand of faith. So what about us today? Luke 18.8, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Unfortunately, there often isn't very much. But to every human being has been given, the Bible says, a measure of faith. God has placed within each of our hands a measure of faith like a mustard seed. But in our hands, it can grow or it can die. By spending time to get better acquainted with our God, with our Savior, our faith and our trust in him will grow. And then as we accept 
and as we act upon the promises that he has made for us. Again, we will find him to be trustworthy and our faith will grow. The potential is tremendous. We have access to the storehouse of heaven's blessings. We can have within our hearts the title deed and everything that it can offer us. And it is in this sense that I believe the, what the Bible means when it says that we can have eternal life right now. John says in John 6, 47, he who believes has, not someday will have, has eternal life right now. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't sleep in the grave for a while, but it means that we can have today the title deed to God's greatest gift, eternal life with him. We just need the title deed, the faith to believe it. So my prayer this morning is that we will learn from history, from Bible history, other history, that we will be willing to move out for God as Abraham did when God calls us, to perform great exploits for God as did Joshua, and that we can say with the confidence of Paul, born of the knowledge of the title deed within our grasp, there is a crown of life awaiting me at that day. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have been so good to us from creation. You have done everything you can to give us a good and happy and fruitful life here. And then when everything went uh, in the wrong direction, you came to save us. And now you want us to have the faith to know that you are coming again, as we just sang about, and that we can have in our hands right now the title deed to assure us that you have a crown of life waiting for each one of us. Amen. Lord, give us the faith to accept, to believe, and to act upon your promises to us so that we can have all that you want us to have now and look forward to eternal life as well. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.